tonight. President Park is among the many paying respects to former President Kim Young Sam today. Dawn will come even if the rooster is strangled. We'll take a look at the life of the late leader and his role in South Korea's rise to democracy. Forgive but never forget. Five years after the Yampyeong shelling, South Korea remembers the North's deadly attack on its border island as the nation vows to beef up its defenses. And terror alert. No sign of a key terror suspect in Belgium raids as Brussels remains under high alert. In Tokyo, Japanese authorities suspect foul play in an explosion at a controversial shrine. It's Monday, November 23rd, 2015. Welcome our viewers here in Korea and around the world. I'm Moon Gan Young and this is New Center. We begin tonight with the passing of one of the most respected pro democracy figures in Korea, former President Kim Young Sam. Kim, who led this country from 1993 to 1998, died in hospital in the early hours Sunday morning. He was 87 years old. A memorial altar for the former leader has been set up at the Seoul National University Hospital. Our Shin Se-min has been on the ground all day, and she joins us live from the hospital in the nation's capital. Se-min, we've been uh, seeing a flow of mourners come in to pay their respects for the second straight day. Good evening, Kanyang. It's cold and late at night, but that hasn't stopped mourners coming in to pay their respect here at the funeral hall at Seoul National University Hospital. As of 9 p.m. Korea time, a total of 12,300 visitors came by to pay their respect um, uh, late today, and today alone, that's over 9,000 visitors. They've been coming in all afternoon, um, at times creating long lines outside of the funeral. Hall. Now, earlier this afternoon, President Park Geun-hye also paid her a visit and offered her condolences to the late president right after returning from her overseas diplomacy trip this morning. Former and current political figures have also visited, including Lee Hye Chang, who served as prime minister during part of late Kim's presidency. And also, U.S. Ambassador to Korea Mark Lippert was also here, as well as business figures, including LG Chairman Koo Bo Moo and Samsung Electronics Vice Chair Lee Jae Yong. And as for the late Kim, his family held an emotional service earlier today to lay his body in a casket, making specific plans for the funeral afterwards. Seven, a state funeral is scheduled for the late president, which is a ceremony at the National Assembly on Thursday. What is the significance of this? Well, yes, the former president, Kim Young sam will be given a state funeral, and that was decided by the cabinet on Sunday afternoon. And in fact, he'll be the first former late president to be given a state funeral since the State Funeral Act was revised last year, November. Now, according to the revised law, the special funeral can be only given to a former or incumbent president or anyone respected for having provided distinguished service to society. Now, unlike other funerals where the mourning period is just three days, um, the period for a state funeral is five days. A national state funeral committee is set up for the funeral headed by the Prime Minister Hwang Gyo-wan. He will also organize everything, selecting from the funeral parlor to supervising the burial ceremonies. Kim's funeral will be held at 2 p.m. on this coming Thursday, and the funeral procession will start in front of the National Assembly and head to the Seoul National Cemetery in Dongjaku District, where he will be laid to rest. So, I mean, uh, for the public who want to pay their respects to the late president, are there uh, public altars set up across the country yet? Kanyang, many of them have been, uh, most of them have been set up, including the major one in front of the National Assembly. And another large altar has also been set up at Seoul Plaza, where the public has been paying tribute uh, starting this afternoon, in fact. And there will be a number of public memorial altars nationwide for people to pay their respects. And in overseas, altars have been set up in Korean embassies for those living abroad. The Interior Ministry says that a me memorial altar 
altar is also open in Kim Young Sam's hometown of Kojedo Island, just off the southeastern tip of the country. Reporting live from Seoul National University Hospital, this has been Shin Semin. More than anything, late President Kim Jong-sam will be remembered as a champion of democracy who fought against military rulers and laid the groundwork for a peaceful power transition in a country rife with military coups. Our Kwon Jang-ho brings us a reflection of who the man he was. Kim Jong-sam became the youngest member of the National Assembly in 1954 as a member of the ruling party of South Korea's first president, Lee seung man in 1979, Kim was expelled from the National Assembly for anti-government activities and criticizing Park jong hee the father of current President Park Geun-hye. In the early 1980s, he was placed under house arrest on two separate occasions for a total of two years, which prompted him to stage a hunger strike. He served in the National Assembly again before winning the presidential election in 1992. The former president has been credited for his role in Korea's pro-democracy movement, where he laid the groundwork for a peaceful transfer of power after decades of military rule. He had his two predecessors, Chun Doo-hwan and No Tae-woo, arrested on mutiny and treason charges for launching a crackdown against anti-government protesters. Kim pardoned them both at the end of his term. The former president was also praised for making the nation's financial system more transparent. He implemented a policy requiring people to use their real names when making financial transactions, as well as ordering high-level public officials to reveal their assets. Without the real name financial transaction system, we cannot root out corruption in this country. However, Kim's term in office wasn't free from criticism. Public sentiment dipped after he accepted a 58 billion US dollar bailout from the IMF in the aftermath of the 1997-98 Asian financial crisis. And in his last year in office, one of his sons was arrested on charges of bribery and tax evasion. Kim apologized for the scandal and later banished his son from public life. The former president is survived by his wife, two sons and three daughters. Kwon jang Arirang News. The late president was credited with disbanding a key military faction and bringing transparency to South Korea's murky financial system. Under President Kim, the economy saw rapid growth, reaching a rate of 10 percent one year, and the nation's per capita income topped 10,000 U.S. dollars for the very first time. But he's also accused of mismanaging the economy during the Asian financial crisis, accepting a $58 billion bailout from the International Monetary Fund. Here's Arirang News, Kim Min-ji. Former President Kim Myung-sam has been credited for his contributions in lifting the Korean economy to a higher level through bold reforms during his term. Korea's economy grew rapidly at a pace not seen during any other administration. According to Statistics Korea and the Bank of Korea, the nation's economic growth rate stood at 6.8 percent during Kim's first year in office. By 1995, it reached almost 10 percent, with the country's national income per person topping 10,000 U.S. dollars for the first time. In 1996, the growth had somewhat slowed, but was still over 7 percent. In the same year, Korea joined the OECD, which many say helped elevate Korea's status in the international community. But in 1997, a dark cloud was cast over the economy. A string of debt-ridden conglomerates collapsed triggered by Hanbo Steel, a subsidiary of the 14th largest conglomerate at the time, Hanbo Group. The total debt of bankrupt companies in that year reached nearly 30 billion U.S. dollars, and Kim was forced to accept a massive bailout from the IMF. Kim was later mocked as the IMF president and criticized for mismanaging the economy. Despite being criticized for failing to reform the conglomerate control system and for not doing enough to rescue the economy, it's true that he made the country's financial system more transparent through implementation of various policies such as a real-name transaction financial system and making high-level public officials disclose their assets. Kim min Arirang News. And for more on late President Kim Young sam and the political legacy he leaves behind, we're joined live by our senior political correspondent, Park Ji-won. Good evening, Ji-won. Now, President Kim uh, is hailed uh, by the Koreans as, you know, being one of the most influential 
pro-democracy activist uh, here in Korean history, and he's also known for having left behind a number of quotes, some of them quite famous, like the one, dawn will come even if the rooster is strangled, you know, which very well expresses Kim's as well as then Korea's yearning for democracy. That's right, Kanyang. Well, the late president was a very much beloved politician for his pro-democracy activism throughout the 1960s to 1980s. Well, he himself went through many ordeals such as house arrest and a hunger strike, but which eventually translated to Kim becoming the first civilian president in 1993, putting an end to some 30 years of authoritarian and military government. And once in office, he showed that his decisiveness by swiftly carrying out a series of striking measures. And which then translated to, in just three months, he disbanded a group of elite generals. Uh, and this purge was later evaluated as a very critical moment in the, in the founding of Korea's modern history and the emergence of military governments, uh, not repeating an emergence of military governments in Korea ever again. That's right, Kanyang. In just three months after coming into office, he disbanded a group of elite generals. And this purge later was evaluated as a critical moment for, uh, for to prevent further emergence of military governments in Korea ever again. He also prohibited a Koreans from owning bank accounts under pseudonyms and made public officials disclose the amount of their wealth. Because of these uh, striking reform measures, he once received an unprecedented 90% approval rating um, in the first year in office, uh, but this... Um Right, 90%, that is a, a whopping 90%. But his presidency was also marked by two major events, uh, that is the 1994 uh, North Korea nuclear crisis, as well as the 97 IMF bailout. That's right, Kanyang. The 1994 nuclear deal between the U.S. and North Korea is now considered a failure, and a scheduled inter-Korean talks were canceled the same year when uh, the North Korean leader Kim Il-sung died suddenly just two weeks before the summit. Kim later said on, in his memoir that the fate had played a uh, trick on him. And in the end, well, his uh, lifetime rival and his uh, president, successor president Kim Dae-jung became the South Korean leader to hold summit talks with North Korea's leader uh, Kim Il-sung in 2000. And that failure to reform the country's alien structure of family-run conglomerates was another uh, factor that uh, analysts say one of the uh, failing factors of his government. Right, so uh, President Kim Dae-jung uh, meeting with uh, then North Korean leader Kim Jong-il, that is. Now, one thing that comes to my mind, like you said, is when we think back at uh, President Kim's legacy, is his longtime, lifetime even, rivalry uh, with President Kim Dae-jung, who later became the president. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, tell us a bit more about their relationship. That's, it's a special one. That's right, Kanye. Well, since um, they are not really related, but they, they did share the same last name, Kim, which is a very common family name here in Korea. Well, individually, they were called by their own initials, YS and DJ, and both were major icons of pro-democracy movement here in Korea, and their lifelong competition shaped Korea's turbulent political landscape from military dictatorship to a democratic society. Well, as you can see from this table, they came from very different families family backgrounds, and they were known uh, for opposite characteristics. But a common factor is that they were both strong opponents to the authoritarian government. They went through various hardships under the authoritarian government. YS was put under house arrest for two years, while DJ was kidnapped in 1973 by the state spy agency. They also fought tooth and nail to win their presidencies. YS became president first in 1993, but DJ took control in the following term. Experts say their competition actually sped up the process of establishing a democratic government in Korea. Take a listen. It's highly likely that if one of the two men did not exist, their achievements would not have been the same. They were rivals, but they fought against a dictatorial government. The competition between them created a synergy that helped to advance democratization. Uh, 
Chiwan, I suppose now it's time for not only the politicians, but you know, all of us living this day and era in this country to really uh, think about or ponder upon what changes the Korea's political landscape could, could or would undergo as we close down on this, the so-called Two Kim era. Well, Kanye, well, political analysts and experts all agree that they were the last Korean politicians who could rally a broad popular supporting base just by their names. It seems from here on, national uh, politics will be much more horizontal and factional. According to a professor of Seoul National University, the introduction of open primaries will eventually be realized here in Korea, with those who earn public support will be earning political leadership. The passing of former President Kim Young Sam symbolizes the end of the so-called boss politics era. And as intra-party conflicts worsen, it's only a matter of time before voters push for an open primary system. When that happens, media politics will take over, where the ability to earn massive public opinion will be the source of political leadership. Jiwon, in a nutshell, I suppose, if uh, the two Kims brought about a transition to democracy in this country, from here on forth, it will be a second level of democracy, if you will, where uh, there will be more of the involvement of the masses than a top-down, uh, I guess, political leadership. All right, well, um, thank you for that, Jiwon, and uh, we look forward to having you again in the studio. Also on this Monday, South Korea marks a solemn anniversary. Five years ago to the day, North Korea unleashed an artillery attack on the south border island of Yeonpyeongdo, killing four and injuring many more. Arirang News National Defense Correspondent Kim Hyun-bin reports. On a quiet afternoon on November 23, 2010, North Korea launched its most deadly attack on South Korean territory since the end of the Korean War. Hundreds of artillery rounds bombarded the western border island of Yongpyeong, killing two civilians, two marines, and wounding many more. Hundreds of civilians were forced to evacuate. To commemorate that day, a ceremony was held on Monday at the War Memorial of Korea in the heart of Seoul. Hosted by the Ministry of Patriots and Veteran Affairs, over 3,000 distinguished guests, including Prime Minister Hwang kyo and Defense Minister Han min gu attended. Hwang paid tribute to the fallen soldiers and emphasized the importance of bringing peace to the Korean peninsula. All the provocations from Pyongyang in the past were painful lessons for us. From that experience, we should work to reach true peace on the peninsula. To do so, the most important thing is to overcome the 70-year-long separation between the two Koreas. President Park Geun-hye, who had just returned from summits overseas, was unable to attend but a pre-recorded commemorative video speech from her was shared, stressing the importance of being ready for any type of threat from the North. South Korean military says if an incident like this happens again, it will immediately retaliate and destroy the origin of attack with more than three times the force used by the North. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. It's been five years, but even today, signs of the attack are difficult to miss among the cottages and alleyways of Yeonpyeongdo Island's port. Even five years later, residents of the South Korean island remember the trauma of November 23, 2010, like it was yesterday. But these islanders remain defiant. They never let fear overcome. 
bombardment of Yunpyeong five years on. Our Connie Kim traveled by land and by sea. She reports from Yunpyeong-do, South Korea. Some 110 kilometers east of the capital Seoul is Yunpyeong-do Island. And less than four kilometers away from the island is North Korea. The only thing that separates the island from the north is an invisible maritime border known as a northern limit line. The island, which sits within close firing range, has been under constant potential threat from North Korea. On November 23, 2010, that concern became a devastating reality. Out of the clear blue sky, North Korean artillery fire pounded Yeonpyeong-do Island. This cement hall was attacked during North Korea's artillery shelling. As you can see, there is a huge hole inside, and you can just see how devastating it was during the shelling. North Korea fired around 170 shells and rockets at the island, hitting 54 buildings, including houses. This alley suffered the worst damage five years ago. Looking at the houses here now, which have since been reconstructed or transformed, it's hard to imagine they were once swallowed by flames, roofs blown off, and windows shattered. When I think of the day when North Korea fired artillery shells, I can't bear it. Everything was on fire. I ran to the evacuation shelter and fled with my grandchildren to Incheon the next day. A total of 32 new buildings and houses have been newly built with the government pouring in 7 million U.S. dollars. But whenever residents here make kimchi, they can't help but think of the day North Korea fired artillery shells on South Korean soil. I will never forget what happened, not until the two Koreas become reunified or give some kind of sign that North Korea will never attack the South again. This is one of the seven newly built evacuation bunkers after North Korea's artillery attacks. It's a constant reminder that residents here are living with threat coming from North Korea. These bunkers replace 19 outdated evacuation centers. And not only do they provide refuge for residents, they have multiple uses, also serving as libraries and community centers. After the North Korean shelling, the government erected a monument on the island in remembrance of two soldiers who sacrificed their lives during the attack. The island has also left some of the burnt houses untouched to show visitors the tragic reality of what happened to South Korea. These are just some of the efforts made by the government to develop Yeonpyeong-do Island into a so-called dark tourism site, where sites of war or disaster are turned into travel destinations. But the number of visitors to Yeonpyeong-do Island has been on a decline after interest in the shelled island peaked the ear following the conflict. Building security training centers could help change the negative image of Yeongpyeong-do Island. Since it's close to North Korea, people can also experience activities related to security education. It's one of the ways to attract tourists to the island, which can lead to transportation infrastructure development and corporate investment. Making sure this island is safe for residents and tourists free from North Korean provocations, South Korean soldiers are based at the local Yeonpyeong unit. Yeonpyeong-do Island is closest to North Korea. In potential threat of clashes, I am on full standby acknowledging that real wartime situation can unfold any time. Yeonpyeong-do Island has slowly been recovering from what many call one of the worst clashes since the outbreak of the Korean War. Overcoming their trauma and memories of the shelling, the island is on the path toward returning to the normalcy it had before the devastation and trying to find a better future as a historic site. Connie Kim, Arirang News. It's been a little over a week since the terrorist attacks in Paris. Belgium is on edge as local authorities take action to protect their citizens from possible terrorist action. Over the last few days, the Belgian police carried out nearly two dozen late-night raids, capturing more than 16 with suspected links to the Paris terrorist attack. 
They've rounded up a number of suspects, but Salah Abdeslan, a key fugitive from the Paris attacks, remains at large. Here's Arirang News' Osu Young with the details. No firearms or explosives were found. Salah Abdeslam is not, not among the persons arrested during the searches. The search for Europe's most wanted man has stretched from Paris to Brussels and now Germany. Belgian authorities said Abdeslam was last spotted Sunday evening near the city of Liège, heading towards Germany. Brussels continues to be on lockdown for the third straight day under a maximum terror alert. It's believed to be a base for many jihadist networks in the region. And authorities believe at least two people are planning imminent attacks in Brussels. While Europe is on high alert, France is gearing up to strike back. France's aircraft carrier the Charles de Gaulle is due to arrive in Syria on Monday, carrying 26 fighter jets which will be fully operational for airstrikes against the Islamic State. Ousiang Arirang News. But France doesn't plan to go it alone. French President François Hollande met with British Prime Minister David Cameron on this Monday to ask how his British ally is going to help in the fight against ISIS. Bruce Harrison is live in the studio with me. Bruce, what support has Cameron offered his uh, French ally at this point? Hello, Konyang. After the, uh, the meeting, the two held a joint press conference and uh, Prime Minister Cameron uh, told France uh, he would offer a British air base in Cyprus uh, as well as additional air-to-air -air refueling. He also said he's going to boost intelligence sharing with France and other European partners. Bruce, uh, what do we know about uh, Britain's plans concerning airstrikes? Well, first, UK Parliament has to approve uh, the request by Cameron uh, to join the coalition in the airstrikes against Islamic State. Uh, he said this is something he firmly believes in doing, so he's going to appeal to members of Parliament this week. Uh, so we'll see in the coming days whether or not Britain becomes part of the bombing coalition. Uh, right now, Holland's going to gather as much support as he can while he waits for an answer. We will intensify our strikes and choose targets that inflict the maximum possible damage on this terrorist army. Hollande will travel to Washington and Moscow this week to appeal for greater support in France's war against ISIS. Outside of Syria, police are battling to round up terrorism suspects, especially in Brussels, Belgium. While those raids are going on, Korea's foreign ministry has recommended Korean nationals avoid travel to Belgium. The ministry has also asked Koreans to leave Mali following the fatal attack at a hotel in the capital of Mako last Friday. A bomb exploded in a bathroom at the Yasukuni Shrine for war dead in Tokyo. Japanese media say no one was hurt in the blast, which damaged the wall and ceiling of the building. Public broadcaster NHK said a hole was discovered in the ceiling, as well as a battery and a lead wire. A bomb disposal unit was sent there to deal with any suspicious objects that hadn't blown up. The shrine seen as a symbol of Japan's past militarism. Among the dead honored there are Class A war criminals, a designation given by a tribunal of judges from Allied forces following the end of World War II. South Korea and China protest often when Japanese politicians pay respects at the shrine. Japan colonized both countries and committed atrocities before and during the war. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe avoided visiting the shrine last month, especially ahead of a trilateral summit here in Seoul uh, between himself and Pre President Park Geun-hye and uh, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. That's correct. He hasn't been there since 2003, and leading up to the summit, as you said, it was probably best not to go, as it was the first time uh, President Park Geun-hye and Abe got the chance to meet. Uh, but despite Abe not attending, Japanese lawmakers still uh, quite often visit the the shrine which is seen as a problem here in Korea and the rest of Asia. Mm -hmm. All right, Bruce, thank you so much for today. Every single month this year, the main driver of the Korean economy exports saw a decrease on slowing global demand, especially in China. But some consumer goods have managed to buck the trend, signaling that there might be some light at the end of the tunnel. Hwang Ji-hye reports. This cosmetics section at a duty-free shop located in the heart of Seoul is bustling with foreigners trying to get their hands on stacks of products. Tracy Wang is one of them. 
Because the K-pop culture is pure popular in Taiwan, so uh, we love to. I love to uh, girl generation and makeup is very beautiful. And such high demand for Korean cosmetic goods is proving to be a breakthrough for sluggish Korean exports. Outbound shipments of local beauty products rose over 50 percent on average in the first nine months of this year, while overall exports dropped more than 6 percent. Data from the Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry shows that some electronics goods and food products are also riding on this trend overcoming otherwise slowing global demand. Exports of products like milk, beer and rice cookers went up almost 25 percent on average during the period. Beauty and food products build a reputation thanks to Korean pop culture in the beginning. But it's the industry's continued R&D efforts and in-depth analysis of foreign markets that actually leads the growth. But as Korea's main export items are mostly intermediary goods like steel and petroleum products, some question whether the surprising growth in the consumer goods sector will be able to lead the country's overall exports. Still, experts say there's great potential because demand for consumer goods will continue to expand in Southeast Asia and China, markets still considered small in comparison to their huge populations. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. A local musical that sold out in theaters across Korea for years and years is seeking success abroad by licensing itself for productions in China. The producers hope the popularity of Korean dramas and music in China will rub off on their show. Our Kim ji brings us Pale, the musical. Ballet means laundry in the Korean language and it plays a vital role in a musical that's named after the chore. The story centers around a young woman named Nayeong who moves to Seoul and meets Solongo, an illegal immigrant from Mongolia, over a load of laundry. They both work hard to get by and struggle to hold on, though life deals them quite a few blows. Ultimately, the story aims to console anyone facing the harsh realities of everyday life. Laundry signifies a longing to cleanse the heart and mind, washing away the dirt, sweat and tears in order to be clean and fresh again. The musical, which is now in its 10th year, has already attracted more than 500,000 people in Korea. The musical was so popular, it was performed in Japan in 2012, and next January it will also be featured in China. China-based Clearsea Holdings is investing two million U.S. dollars into the musical for a license to present it in China through 2021. It's expecting a return on the investment within two years, thanks to the high demand for Korean cultural content spurred by the Korean wave. Since Korean TV series has been very popular and Chinese people audience are very familiar with the language, so about the familiarity of a culture is, plays a big part of that. If we know the culture, if we know the background, know the language, that definitely help a lot. Musicals are a booming business in China, with the industry growing at around 25 percent a year. The only problem seems to be that there isn't enough content to satisfy the growing demand for quality shows. But that's where Korean musicals come in. We work with libertists in the countries we perform in to cater to their tastes while staying true to the musical's core. I hope more Korean musicals can thrive by licensing their productions overseas. In Korea, the musical is presented seven times a week at the Tongyang Arts Center in the heart of the theater district in Seoul. Kim Jung, Arirang News. We're already into the last days of November, and last Friday, if I remember correctly, Jihan advised us to take out our winter jackets and snow boots over the weekend. Jihan, I'm going to come clean. I was too lazy to.
Well, good evening, Kwon Young. But for other viewers, if you did take out your coats and thick jackets, it was a timely thing to do. This week, we might see the first snow of the season in many parts of the country, either on Wednesday or Thursday. And along with that, significant drop in temperatures are forecasted this week. We can expect this sudden but short cold snap to peak on Friday and Saturday, but temperatures will go back to the normal level next week. And as of tomorrow, partly sunny skies will kick off the day, but it should get cloudier as the day goes on. And late night showers are forecasted for many parts of the country. And in the meantime, mountainous regions in Gangwon-do province are forecast to see heavy snowfall of more than 50 centimeters. On that note, let's move on to tomorrow's temperature readings. Now, Seoul will start out at 4, Daejeon, 6 and 8 for Daegu, while Busan and Jeju will start out at 11 and 12, respectively. And afternoon highs will be also chillier than today, as the daily high here in the capital will peak at 10, Daejeon for the 10 as well, Daegu 12, and Busan and Jeju will top out at 15 and 14. So be sure to dress warmly tomorrow. Now that's Korea for you, and here's international weather for viewers around the world. The last words of former President Kim Yong-sam to his junior politicians were reportedly harmony and unity. Something to think about for all of us here in Korea on this Monday evening. I'm Moon Gon Young. Thank you everyone for watching and we hope to see you right back here same time tomorrow on New Center.